Everyday Environment webinar topic is potential impacts of climate change on Lake Michigan. Our speaker is Dr. Paris Collinsworth. Dr. Collinsworth is an assistant research professor in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue University and a Great Lakes Ecosystem Specialist for Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. So Paris, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay, are you guys seeing that? Yes, looks good. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for that introduction. Um, and as Eliana mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about potential climate change impacts on Lake Michigan. I wanted to start by just sort of giving a brief outline of what I plan to cover during this talk. I'm gonna start with some introduction first, just a little bit about me. Uh, a little bit of an introduction about the Laurentian Great Lakes. I then want to talk about the ecosystem services that are provided by the Great Lakes and, uh, and especially Lake Michigan. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change. What is the current evidence uh, that we have based on monitoring programs for climate change happening in the lakes? And then I'm going to spend a bit more time on uh, the projections that we have for what the climate is going to look like in Lake Michigan in the future. And then I'm going to conclude with some um, some of the climate change impacts on the ecosystem services in Lake Michigan and talk a little bit about the uh, potential man management actions that can be used to counter the things that are going on uh, with respect to climate change. Uh, but to begin, as Ileana did a great job of introducing me, I'm a research professor at Purdue University. I also work as a Great Lakes Ecosystem Specialist with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. And one of the important points uh, that I did want to uh, emphasize here is that a lot of my work is supported by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and they have an office in Chicago that's uh, the Great Lakes National Program Office. And that's uh, where a lot of my support comes from. Um, that's where my office is uh, in Chicago. And um, the, the important part of that is this is the group within the EPA that is obligated uh, because of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that we have with Canada. This is the group that monitors the conditions in the Great Lakes. And so it's a really nice place to be um, with a lot of resources. Uh, the, the ship that I have here uh, on the screen is uh, the research vessel Lake Guardian, which is the ship that the EPA uses to monitor conditions in the Great Lakes. So now moving into some background uh, about the Great Lakes. Um, the Laurentian Great Lakes were formed um, at the end of the last ice age. Uh, prior to that, they were covered by the Laurentide Ice Sheet until about 11,000 years ago. And this uh, graphic here on the right is a representation of the maximum extent of the Laurentide ice sheet. So this was a huge sheet of ice that covered most of North America um, for thousands of years and started melting about 11,000 years ago. And it was this ice sheet, which was you know miles thick, that formed uh, the Great Lakes because of the scouring action of the ice sheets. Uh, when they began to recede at the end of the last ice age, the melting water uh, from the glaciers is actually what filled the lakes. And um, there's this interesting phenomenon called isostatic rebounding. Uh, the, the ice sheet was so thick that it actually compressed the land that was underneath it. So as the ice sheet receded, the water melted, it formed the lakes, but then the land started to rebound. The land started to sort of push upward. And that um, isostatic rebounding, it actually continues today, uh, but it was the sort of final thing that gave the final shape of the lakes. And it also was the, the thing that directed the flow of the water from the Great Lakes eastward uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. And that's surprising to a lot of people sometimes that the Great Lakes have flow to them. They are lakes, but there is a, it's actually kind of uh, 
useful to think of the lakes as sort of a river system with uh, water flowing uh, from the headwaters uh, in Lake Superior. And then it goes uh, through lakes, the St. Mary's River into Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, which are actually kind of basins uh, the, of the same lake, um, which is why they're sort of depicted uh, together here. And then water flows through uh, Lake Huron into the St. Clair River, into Lake St. Clair, and then the Detroit River through Lake Erie, and then um, goes over Niagara Falls uh, in the Niagara River uh, to Lake Ontario, and then eastward out into the Atlantic Ocean through the St. Lawrence River. So I mention this because, you know, one, it's, it's an interesting fact that the lake the Great Lakes are sort of behave like a river, uh, although on a very, very slow time scale. Uh, but also that the things that happen in one part of the Great Lakes Basin eventually can impact another, like productivity in Lake Erie affects Lake Ontario. Uh, uh, so this is uh, sort of a, a holistic approach uh, view of the whole basin. Uh, so now I wanna talk about some of the ecosystem services provided by Lake Michigan. Um, so first of all, the Laurentian Great Lakes in North America, uh, it's one of the greatest natural resources in the world. Um, this system holds approximately 20% of the water uh, on the on planet Earth. So we're sitting right next door to 20% of the fresh water on the planet. And as we uh, go through time, I think it'll be really obvious of, of how how uh, great a natural resources this is to have in our backyard. Uh, the Laurentian Great Lakes are also home to more than 30 million U.S. and Canadian citizens. So here, this um, brown area on this map, this is the watershed of the Great Lakes Basin. So any water that falls on this brown area will eventually make its way into the Great Lakes and out uh, the St. Lawrence River to the to the Atlantic Ocean. But I do want to point out, since this is sort of an Illinois-centric uh, web webinar that we're doing here, uh, just that how little of the actual watershed is in, is in Illinois. It's just sort of a tiny fraction of the overall watershed. But here in Illinois, we actually do still uh, get a lot of ecosystem services from the lakes. And so, when I'm talking about ecosystem services, um, it can be defined as the varied benefits that humans are provided by natural environments and from healthy ecosystems. And I have this graphic here. This is sort of the nomenclature of the U.S. Clean Water Act. And in the Clean Water Act, uh, for aquatic ecosystems, the goal is that the water would be swimmable, drinkable, and fishable. So the idea here is that swimmable, meaning that we can recreate in the water, um, not just swimming, but boating. Um, drinkable, meaning these, the water provides um, clean drinking water for the people in the surrounding area. And then fishable, and fishable meaning that um, we have healthy populations of the types of fish that we want in a specific system. So now moving specifically to uh, Lake Michigan in terms of uh, drinkability, this is the, the Harrison Dever water intake crib, which is about four miles off of Navy Pier in Chicago. And the Illinois waters of Lake Michigan provide drinking water for about 7 million people. Um, so again, we have that small little sliver of the coastline, but still 7 million people are getting drinking water uh, from Lake Michigan. And as compared to overall in Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan provides drinking water for a little over uh, 10 million people in Michigan and Wisconsin and Illinois and Indiana. The waters of Lake Michigan are also uh, swimmable and fishable, or at least we certainly get use out of them. And so this is a graphic from a recent paper by Allen et al, where they were trying to quantify the ecosystem services that the Great Lakes provide. And um, if we sort of focus in on Lake Michigan and particularly Southern Lake Michigan, 
Uh, we see in graph A that there is a lot of sport fishing that happens in the Lake Michigan waters. Um, between um, 120,000 and, and 2 million private hours of sport fishing. So hours that people are out on the lake. Uh, they're also spending money to, buy, to purchase uh, time on charter boats. So uh, in graph B, we have sport fishing effort and between uh, 15,000 and 150,000 hours. Uh, there are a lot of boat ramps in the area for graph C. Um, in most of Southern Lake Michigan, we're in that highest category, which is between 351 and 3,000 uh, boat slips, marine slips. Uh, people are also, uh, they're going to the beaches. They're using, um, using the beaches for recreation. And again, Lake Michigan in graph D here, you see a lot of red, um, which is actually a, an interesting metric of people taking pictures per day of themselves at the beach. And it's between 10 and 282 uh, in Southern Lake Michigan. Uh, they're using the, the lakes for birding, so birding uh, hot spots, so visits to birding areas in graph E, um, and also uh, park visitation. So this is uh, in F, this is the number of uh, parks, but also the use of the park. So if you look along Southern Lake Michigan, most of those parks are, are red in terms of like, they're the highest use uh, parks in the Great Lakes Basin. So people are definitely using the Lake Michigan for recreation, uh, and they're also using it for fishing. And then this is sort of a summary of all of this um, in terms of uh, the use, recreation use. So recreation being, you know, beach access, boating, fishing, and then the amount of ecosystem stress uh, that's in a specific area. And if you look down here at the uh, Illinois coastline, uh, what you can see is we're in a pretty fortunate situation here where we have an area that has high recreation, uh, but also low stress. And this stress is coming primary, primarily from uh, water quality impairments and also um, contaminants. So in terms of uh, our use of the lake, we're actually getting pretty good use of Southern Lake Michigan. Southern Lake Michigan is also important for the economy of Illinois. Uh, tourism uh, on an annual basis brings about 20 million people to the Illinois, again, that tiny little sliver of the Illinois uh, Lake Michigan coastline. And then the combined recreation of all these people uh, people, again, going fishing, uh, hitting the beaches, uh, going boating. It generates about $3.2 billion annually in Illinois, and it supports about 33,000 jobs. So this is, again, an important, um, an important economic, economic driver uh, of the area. So now I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, and we're going to talk about uh, climate change. And we're going to talk about, first of all, what kind of evidence that we have that climate change is occurring in the Great Lakes. Uh, and this is based on the current monitoring programs that we have going on. So this first graph is a, um, a measure of surface water temperature in all five of the Great Lakes going back to 1980 through 2015. And this is a graph from a publication um, where I was the lead author back in 2017, looking at climate effects on fisheries in the Great Lakes. Um, we were, again, considering all of the Great Lakes. Uh, but here, what I want you to focus on is Lake Michigan in that blue line. And uh, these are data that are surface temperature data that was uh, taken from the EPA Glenpo long-term monitoring program. And the blue line here is Lake Michigan. And we do see a significant increase in water temperatures from 1980 to 2015. Although what we're seeing is about an increase of 0.02 degrees Celsius uh, per year. 
So again, this is a whole lake sort of estimate. And um, you know what we see is is a warming, but it's not a, a tremendous amount of warming uh, over this 35 year time period. Uh, again, and now this is more specific to Lake Michigan. This is a graph uh, from a recent paper uh, published in Nature uh, by the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, and they're looking at long term data uh, based on a, a thermistor string. So basically, a big string of of temperature gauges uh, that goes down to 110 meters in the water column. And this group was able for the first time to show increasing temperature over time in deep waters of the Great Lakes. The general impression was that the, the Great Lakes, the surface might be warming, but there is a large area of the Great Lakes on the bottom that is remaining cold. Um, but again, this paper showed that that's not necessarily the case, that we are seeing some warming in the bottom waters of, the, of Lake Michigan as well. And then finally, again, the first graph I showed you was a lake-wide uh, estimate. Uh, this is Lake Superior, but this is a recent paper that my lab published in 2020, where we were looking at spatial variation. So variation across the lake in the surface warming um, in these surface in surface warming. And what we're seeing is that depending where you are in different parts of the lake, you might see warming, you might see a consistent trend across time, or you might actually see some slight cooling in the lake. So that all of this like sort of spatial variation, the deep water variation, the variation across space, it sort of confounds the lake-wide estimates that we're getting. Uh, but the general pattern in, in all of the monitoring data and what we're seeing is that we are seeing an increase in temperatures in the waters of the Great Lakes. So now I'm going to move uh, into the projections that we're getting for the future, future conditions for climate change. So there is a really long history uh, of developing climate models. So these are models that take into account all sorts of different factors, uh, things like land cover, uh, the amount of snowpack that we have in the Arctic, and then other forcing factors. And one of the most famous ones being greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide. And they're using um, these variables uh, in combination with the observed temperature increases that we're seeing. So here on this graph, what you're seeing is an increase in temperature, with the gray line being the actual values. And what you can see in that gray line is there's a lot of variability. It sort of bounces up and down a lot. Uh, but the orange line is the actual like sort of smooth trend. So what you're seeing on this graph is that there is a, a an increase in temperature uh, through this time period, although there is a lot of variability. But then these global climate models, what they do is they project future conditions uh, based on that current trajectory, so that trend that already exists. Uh, plus, they're also making some assumptions about the future driving factors. So like one of the most obvious things is what are the future emissions of carbon dioxide going to look like? Or what happens if we lose snow in the Arctic that can actually help reflect uh, some of the light and heat out of the atmosphere. What if we lose that and then we get um, something that does does a better job of absorbing uh, absorbing the heat and increasing temperatures? So these future uh, these global climate models are all about the future projections of different of the the heating of the Earth based on different assumptions. And so these global models are uh, developed on a regular basis. Uh, but if you're a natural resource manager and you're thinking about what's going on in Lake Michigan, uh, it's better to have some more location specific information. And that's um, where a lot of the people that I work with, what they're working on are these regional climate models. So you can take that global climate model, which represents sort of the best science that we have about what conditions are gonna look like. 
and then sort of force that into a regional model that helps you get more localized predict predictions about what's going to happen in the future. And so I've been working really closely with a group out of Michigan Tech. Um, and this is uh, based on a paper that they published in 2022 from Zoo et al, uh, where they look at a downscaled climate model to project climate change effects in the Great Lakes. So a downscaled GCM to the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, they use two different uh, scenarios, and these are uh, global, these are uh, greenhouse gas emission scenarios. Uh, they use the R RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. Uh, the RCP rep is, uh, RCP stands for representative concentration pathways. So the concentrations pathways of the uh, greenhouse gases. So I'm going to show a lot of data and we're going to look at these two different scenarios. So RCP 4.5 is a stabilization scenario. It's kind of a, a a rosy outlook like that the, we're going to we're we're going along these current trajectories but things are going to stabilize through time whereas the rcp 8.5 is more of like a high high emission scenario so we don't really do things to change our behavior and we're going to keep emitting uh, greenhouse gases at a high level this is what it's going to look like and then for today's presentation i'm going to uh, focus on three different forecasted variables. Uh, lake surface temperature, obviously surface temperature would be important. Uh, ice cover and then uh, precipitation patterns, which is turns out to be something that consistently comes up in these climate models is these changes in precipitation patterns. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, what do the models tell us? Uh, first of all, what we're going what we're going to see in the future? is that we're gonna see the air temperatures are going to increase, which is not necessarily surprising, right? Um, uh, temperature increase in the air between one and five degrees, depending on the different scenario that we're looking at in the different time frame. So uh, a lot of these graphs are gonna look the same, so I'm gonna walk you through this. Uh, on the top, graphs A and B, that represents the RCP 4.5. So that's the stabilization scenario. And the difference between A and B is A is RCP 4.5 projected out to the time period of 2030 to 2049. And B is that same model projected out to 2080 so 20, to 2099. So on the right side of the graph, we're seeing farther into the future. And then on the bottom in C and D, that's the RCP 8.5 scenarios during the same time period. So what you can see is the most minor uh, warming patterns happen in the lower emission scenario and on a shorter time horizon. Whereas the sort of worst case scenario for us is with the high emission scenario projected out uh, in, into about a hundred years into the future, or not, I'm sorry, about 80 years into the future. Okay. So we know now air, air temperature is going to increase. We also um, see from these models that water temperature is going to increase as well. And so this is, these graphs are, sh are showing um, the lake surface temperature changes. And for B, that's Lake Michigan. On the x-axis, we have each month of the year and then on the y-axis, we have the amount of increase uh, based on compared to the baseline scenario. So compared to current conditions. And this is all projected out to 2080 to 2099. But we can see uh, if we focus in on Lake Michigan, uh, well, the patterns are all the same, but the magnitude uh, changes with the scenario. So the higher um, the higher emission scenario produces higher, more warming in the lakes. Um, but the annual, annual patterns are consistent. So what we're seeing is an increase in temperature across the year, but we're seeing the highest temperature increases uh, in the sort of April through June, July time period. Uh, we're also seeing from these models that stratification patterns will change. 
So Lake Michigan is what is called a dimictic lake. It stratifies twice a year. The first time uh, it stratifies is when there is ice. So ice is the cold upper layer, and then you have a warm lower layer. But then as the year progresses and the water, the ice melts and the water warms, what you will get is another period of stratification in the summer where you have a warm surface layer and then a really dramatic decline in temperatures past a certain depth. Um, and that's, that's the, the summer stratification. So here on these graphs, um, what we're looking at, this is in the first two graphs, it's Lake Michigan, the second two graphs, uh, Southern Lake Michigan. And then we're looking at basically the annual warming patterns of a lake of the lake uh, for a given year. And so each of those dashes on the x-axis is a month. And then we're looking, starting up at the top left at, at the surface and then going down. So what you can see from these graphs, um, the first graph is the historical average, sort of the baseline. And then the second graph is the, R, the high emission scenarios in 2080 through 99. Uh, but the important takeaway here is that basically we totally lose winter stratification uh, in this, during this time period in Northern Lake Michigan and in Southern Lake Michigan. So what that means is we're basically going to lose uh, the ice period, which that's really important for the ecology of the lakes. And then as we move into the summer, we're seeing an increase in the duration and the intensity of summer stratification. So that red, really warm surface water, it's getting darker red and it's lasting for a longer time and it's going deeper down into the water column. So we're seeing more intense stratification um, in the surface waters during summer stratification, sorry. Okay, so that's what the climate models tell us about water temperature. So what about ice cover? And as you can imagine from the graph that I just showed you, there's going to be a reduction in ice cover as well. So in Lake Michigan, again, this is graph B. Um, what we see is during the baseline time, so the blue line, uh, we see about, on average, about 25% of the lake gets ice cover during a typical year. Um, under the different climate sa change scenarios uh, in the next 80 years, uh, we're going to see that reduced. In the stabilization scenario, we're gonna see it reduced down to about 10% ice cover. And in the uh, high emission scenario, we'd see only about 5% of the lake uh, having ice cover in a given year. So less ice, warmer water temperatures and less ice cover. So what about precipitation patterns? Okay, here again, this is the same situation where we have the stabilization scenarios on A and B on the top, high emission scenarios on the bottom. Uh, but what we're seeing is we're gonna see an increase in precipitation pretty much across uh, the Great Lakes Basin. But, um, you see a really strong increase in precipitation if we project farther out into the future and under the, uh, the higher emissions scenario. So we're going to see more water coming in, uh, more rain, more storm events. And again, this is not going to be evenly distributed. So this is the precipitation change uh, through the season. And so again, for the low, lower emission scenario, we're seeing upwards around a 20% increase in precipitation. Uh, but if you look at these graphs, what you can see is you see a lot more precipitation happening in the March, April, May time period. Um, and this is under both of these uh, emission scenarios, where in the high emission scenario out to 2099, we see over a 40% increase in precipitation during the month of May. So this is pretty commonly, this pretty commonly comes out of these climate models and the way it's in sort of lay terms, what, what we kind of say is there's going to be 
more frequent and more intense spring storms coming with climate change. And that again has a lot of ramifications uh, for the lakes as well. So we've talked about climate change and the projections that we're going to have into the future. Uh, but now let's talk a little bit about the climate change impacts uh, that we're going to see on the ecosystem services that we get from the lakes. <clears throat> so first of all, climate change impacts on the drinkable water in Lake Michigan. Uh, the two things that are sort of combining here to impact the drinkability of Lake Michigan's water are increased water temperatures and increased storm frequency. So increased water temperatures means that you're basically you're increasing the biological activity in the lakes, particularly in nearshore areas. So these nearshore areas are where we tend to draw the water. Increased storm frequency, uh, meaning that we're getting more nutrients coming off of the lake, uh, off of the watersheds. So when the rain hits the watershed, especially in the spring when there isn't a lot of like green grass and there isn't crops uh, on, the, on the watershed, what you're seeing is a lot of those nutrients are just coming straight into the tributaries and then they're making their ways into the lakes. So increased storm, storm frequency, particularly in the spring, means increases in nutrient delivery. So that in combined, combined with warmer water temperatures, uh, what that means is there's a higher likelihood for drinking water impairments with climate change. And in some coastal areas, like, like in the Chicago area, we might see the potential for harmful algal blooms. So harmful algal blooms are blooms of a specific type of algae that uh, they can be present at really high levels. And then they also um, produce uh, toxins that, that make the water uh, undrinkable. Uh, the best example of this is in 2015 or 2014, the city of Toledo uh, couldn't drink the water coming out of Lake Erie because they had a harmful algal bloom that affected their water intake cribs. And so this is the type of thing that is more likely to happen when you have warmer water temperatures and increased storm frequency as a result of climate change. So how do we manage for things like this? Um, the first thing, so I'm going to show a lot of, uh, I'm going to show three different tables like this where we're going to talk about what's the problem, what's the underlying causes, and then what are the potential management actions that can alleviate these problems. Uh, so the first problem uh, managing for drinking, wa drinking water would be, the problem would be water quality impairments. Uh, the underlying causes, as I just mentioned, would be warming temperatures, and changing precipitation patterns, changing the nutrient uh, delivery to the lake. In terms of uh, potential management actions, um, most of the management actions for drinking water, uh, besides increasing you know, the capacity and the effectiveness of our, of our um, drinking water treatment would be things that happen up in the watershed. So placement of green infrastructure in urban areas and the use of best management strategies in agricultural areas uh, will help alleviate some of that nutrient delivery, uh, some of the nutrient, nutrient delivery problems into Lake Michigan. So for green infrastructure, what I'm talking about is basically anything that's like slowing the, slowing the uh, speed of water getting into the tributaries. Uh, things like, like green roofs, uh, on buildings, uh, porous concrete, anything that slows down the flow of water uh, in urban areas that keeps it from going straight into the, into the lake is beneficial. And in terms of best management strategies for agricultural, uh, it, it's really sort of similar kinds of things like putting um, two-stage ditches in for um, in agricultural areas um, just basically increasing uh, green space in between the field and the uh, tributaries that enter Lake Michigan. Okay, so that's managing for drinkable water. Uh, well, what about climate change impacts on swimmable beaches? Um, so here uh, we have really similar sort of problems. We have increased water temperature, 
increased storm frequency. Uh, again, they're sort of increasing the biological activity, increasing the nutrient levels uh, in the lakes. And so this is causing, you know, problems with beach closures. So you're going to have a higher likelihood uh, for E. coli problems at the beaches, um, closing down the beach, making them in inaccessible for people for recreation. Uh, there's also with increased storm uh, frequency, we also see an increase in uh, shoreline erosion. So some of these sandy beaches um, will get swept away uh, during storm events, uh, which can be a real problem for the economies. You know, for it, it costs a lot of money to uh, put up structures that uh, protect against this er erosion and also for transplanting uh, sand around the Great Lakes to make sure that we have high quality beaches. So for swimmable water, again, uh, what's the problem? Um, we have water quality impairments, potentially HABs on the beaches. Uh, the underlying causes being warmer temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, uh, potential management actions for uh, the swimmable water is basically the same as for the uh, drinkable water, which is, again, uh, placement of green infrastructure in urban areas and the use of best management strategies in agricultural areas. Um, specifically to uh, beach closures, uh, one of the problems that we have in the Lake Michigan watershed is a lack of sort of proper septic, septic systems. There's still a lot of uh, septic tanks that people have in their yards in the in the watershed, uh, and combining that with changing precipitation patterns, you have uh, the potential for more sort of leakage of E. coli uh, that can get into um, riverways and cause beach closures. Um, but again, um, green infrastructure, best management practice, practice strategies. But also updating uh, septic systems in the watershed is an important uh, potential management action for managing Lake Michigan to have swimmable beaches. And the last thing will be uh, potential climate change impacts on the fishable waters. So here we have a few more things that are impacting uh, the fishable waters of the Great Lakes. Uh, we have increased water temperatures from climate change. Uh, increased water temperatures overall um, will impact things, but one of the primary things that will be an issue with increased water temperatures is that we'll have a higher likelihood for invasive species. So the Great Lakes are a well-used system um, that th there's a lot of boat traffic on the Great Lakes. There's a lot of traffic between lakes and between the lakes and also uh, intercontinental shipping. Um, so there's a, with warmer temperatures, you have the higher likelihood that these uh, invasive species will find a better place, uh, the Great Lakes to be a better place for them. Uh, increased water temperatures also changes the, the distribution of fishes. A lot of the fish are in the Great Lakes like cold water. So uh, a lot of time they're going to be moving farther offshore in warmer temperatures. Uh, and so that affects, it doesn't necessarily affect the fish as much, but if you're a charter fisherman and you are, your, your entire livelihood centers around getting people to the fish, you're going to be spending more money on gas to get out to where the fish are. And so that could have a really uh, strong impact on local economies if charter fisher, fishermen are, are having to pull out because it's not economically viable they're having to go too far offshore to catch desired fish species. And also increased water temperature can have a negative impact on native species. There are some species uh, such as lake whitefish, which seem to need to have ice uh, in order to protect their eggs because their eggs are incubating over winter. And um, decreasing ice cover, increasing water temperature can have a negative impact on these native species. So again, what's the problem for invasive species? Uh, one of the, for the problem of invasive species, one of the under underlying causes would be warmer water temperatures in the Great Lakes. 
Uh, and in terms of potential management actions, there are management actions in place to try to control invasive species. Uh, one famous example is the electrical barriers that are in the Illinois River to keep the big head and silver carp in the river and out of Lake Michigan. Um, so it's important to maintain this and also to maintain ballast water treatments. So a lot of the invasive species that are coming into the Great Lakes now are coming uh, through ballast water in intercontinental shipping. And I wanted to throw this graphic up here. Uh, this is a really neat graphic that's showing, it's basically all of these lines are the paths of ships, international shipping containers. And uh, one thing that's really stands out here is if you look in the inland water, or if you look on land, a lot of times you don't see a lot of these, these, shipping, uh, these shipping tracks. Uh, but one place where you do see is in the Great Lakes. Uh, we see a, a white line that's going down the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway and up into the Great Lakes. So the Great Lakes are a destination for intercontinental shipping. And with that intercontinental shipping uh, comes invasive species via ballast water. Um, managing for fisheries and climate change. Uh, another problem that we're going to see is changing fish distributions uh, due to war warming temperatures. Uh, one thing that fisheries managers are going to have to consider here is shifting angler expectations towards more adaptable species. Uh, so species that can tolerate warmer temperatures. So rather than just focusing all of the fishing pressure on something like, say, Chinook salmon, uh, maybe we should start to promote uh, fishing for fish that tolerate warmer temperatures, things like walleye. Uh, but this is going to be a this is going to be a thing that's going to take probably at least a generation to uh, to get the anglers to accept it. Uh, and then finally, for declining native species, uh, we see uh, the problem is declining native species. The underlying cause being the loss of ice cover. Uh, a potential management action for this would be to protect or enhance uh, productive stocks. Um, so to take the Lake Whitefish example, if they do need ice to uh, pull off a successful reproduction, then we need to protect places where we have productive stocks and we also have ice cover, and we're projected to see that out in the future. Um, a place like Green Bay, um, where they do have productive lake whitefish, and they will continue to see ice in the future. It's important not to sort of overfish those areas and to protect uh, the native species that we have there. Okay, so I want to wrap up with a few take-home points, um, really basic, uh, but Lake Michigan is a valuable natural resource that provides many ecosystem services to Illinois and to the surrounding states. Uh, climate change is a persistent but not entirely novel threat to ecosystem services. And what I mean by that is like climate change, it interacts with existing stressors, things like nutrient dynamics um, that we're already sort of thinking about in, in the management context. And so the threats of climate change should provide an extra motivation uh, to deal with the current stressors that are affecting Lake Michigan. And so with that, um, I would uh, say thank you for your attention and I would take any questions.